All right, I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I have this slide up here, which represents it's a diagram that I use throughout the presentation. Um, I'm not going to try to make you guess what all this means, so I'll explain it a little bit. Uh, this is supposed to represent a, um, an anecdotal or an example of, a, of an e-commerce application. So cloud is the internet. Uh, the orange little database is the database. And then the black, the black box represents one application node or service. And each of the blue squares represents a different feature of that service. So in an e-commerce application, I have uh, the little screen is product browsing. The book is product administration. The money bag is for purchase or order placement. And the shopping cart is a shopping cart. Um, so with that said, my name is Steve Pember. I work for a company called Cantina out of Boston. And uh, this talk is called Why Reactive Architecture Will Take Over the World um, and Why We Might Be Afraid That It, or Why We Might Be Afraid That It Would Be Involve Node.js. Another title is Why I Hate Monolithic Applications. Um, let's talk about application scalability and complexity. So as I get started, I have a few questions that I want to ask you. And I want you to keep them in the back of your mind throughout the talk. So first, have you ever wondered why your company's code base is all in one repository? Is everything run inside of trunk or master? Have you ever thought, why are there so many tables in our database? Have you ever dreaded executing the unit test suite? Have you ever tried TDD? Do you miss test-driven development? Have you ever had to go through a major refactoring of your application? whether it was just a, a total overhaul or just you know, a few features within it, and how did it go? Have you ever had to go on a whale hunt or an archaeological expedition in the code base just to add a new feature? And if so, did it take you longer to figure out how things work in your system than it did to actually build the new feature? Do you have somebody on your staff that you have to pull in who's been there long enough that they know the entire system? You have to pull them in, take away their time to help you? And if you've answered yes to any of those questions, you might have what I, what I call a mono, or what's called a monolithic application. I feel your pain. So with traditional monolithic architecture, you can build out your application very quickly. You can reach the delivery. You can have your application out in the world very fast. And, and the entirety of your application's functionality is in one convenient location. But that's it. As your application grows, the complexity will soon become enormous. Trying to figure out where things are, how they work, which seemed so easy in the beginning, over time becomes very difficult and very difficult to manage, particularly once you start to attract users and grow your team. A monolithic application will not scale. And you might be saying, wait a minute, what do you mean it won't scale? I can take my application and I could you know, throw it up on Amazon AWS or provision a few servers, put it behind a load balancer, you know, all talking to the same database. Come on in. Um, so I, I can load balance my application. And if the database becomes too much of a problem, I can set up database replication, you know, set up the little star supposed to be the master, set up master-slave replication. Um, but you could. But that's not exactly what I mean when I say scale. So have you ever seen a database or class schema that looks something like this? Like you might have in your, in your, uh, in your team's room, you might have a wall. This is actually the largest I could find on Google Images. But I'm sure you've all seen it where people have printed out the database schema or the code base and just had it plastered on the wall. Yeah. Anytime you see that, that's bad news. <laughs> Um, if, you, if something is clearly going wrong, the, the ability to add new features, to fix bugs, to resolve technical debt, to not scale with the, size the, with the size of your application if you continue to follow this monolithic approach. Throwing more developers at it also will not help. We'll just get in each other's way. You know, get, uh, conflicts, you know, merge errors, all that stuff. Um, one of the most passive aggressive comments I've ever, uh, I've ever seen, I was working on a client and uh, they had they were building this very large application. 
and uh, I work as a consultant, by the way. And so we, we, we came in, and uh, the developers that were already there were getting very frustrated that uh, they, they thought that throwing too many people at the problem was not the solution. And so they had this wall in their, you know, the workroom that was one of those whiteboard walls where you can draw on it and just wipe it off. And over, overnight, someone had scrawled, um, you can't make one baby, or you can't make a baby in one month with nine women. <laughs> which was, which, you know, the management erased it very quickly. But it's, it's very fun. Um, and uh, again, trying to refactor anything, you know, forget it. I've seen this happen a few times where, you know, the company will start out by creating a team to re-implement some new feature, um, or to, and they end up developing the application in parallel. But management wants the first application to have a bunch of new features. So then the other team has to go back and add the new features into the new system. And, uh, and so they start developing side by side, and it's, it's horrible. Uh, and you know, it's, as the size of the code base com uh, increases, the computational complexity will exponentially increase and, and has adverse effects on maintenance. There's been papers written about this very subject. The larger the code base gets, the harder it is to deal with. So if this is such a misguided architecture, it makes you wonder exactly how we ended up there. And I blame the large MVC frameworks, including Grails, all of them. And don't get me wrong, I love Grails. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? I mean, it's, it's fantastic. But they're touted as the magic cure-all for building your app or your product. They, and, uh, your entire company should be based around this lifestyle of using these frameworks. Like, uh, you hear startups all the time where, where they'll be like, oh, we're a, we're a Rails shop. You know, you should come work with us. That's a horrible answer to the question, right? If somebody says, you know, what are you all using? It shouldn't be, oh, we use Rails. It should be, well, it's difficult. We've got a system that uses Java to, for searching. We've got another one that uses, uh, you know, Netty for, you know, de dealing with some background processing. And we use Grails for our web server, you know, that, that sort of stuff. That's, that's the right answer. Uh, by the way, is a, I don't, I don't know if this translates, but in English, there's this, there's this term called a snake oil salesman, which is basically a fake product. Uh, anyway. So, and I think this is the key point of this presenta presentation, that architecture choice is vastly more important than any framework you'll ever use. And I'm going to say that again because it's that important, but louder this time. Architecture choice is more important than any framework with the caveat that we all know we should be using something on the JVM, right? And there has been attempts to fix this, right? I mean, who here has heard of service-oriented architecture? Yeah. yeah. And it's, in, in, in theory, it's fantastic. So what, what, it, what it involves is taking your monolithic application. So for those who missed the beginning, the, uh, the square box is supposed to represent one application service, and each of the blue items is, is a distinct feature within that app. So with SOA, we would break up each feature into an individual smaller component or service and set up some communication strategy between the two. Um, so these calls are traditionally using synchronous HTTP or, uh, you know, or SOAP or you know, something like that. But by breaking this up, it starts to make the complexity clearer and makes things easier to understand, to follow, to track. Um, and having, uh, because these are all in each of their own code base, it makes it easier for your team to specialize on one particular component easier to manage, easier to track, easier to know exactly where a bug is if something goes wrong. And having these smaller broken up applications creates faster, smaller, leaner code, which results in rapid long-term development time as you know exactly where a new feature needs to go and you can, it's, it's easier to grasp what is involved with putting that new feature in your system and easier code maintainability because Bugs are vastly easier to discover. If you know there's a problem with the shopping cart, you know that the entire problem is going to be situated in the shopping cart service. It's not if you make a change, you, you know you safely don't have to worry about it breaking something else you know, in another part of your system. And it also saves you money. Because, you know, and some other numbers that managers like, right? If I, if I can get things done faster with a smaller team, that's, that's good. So I use the term microservice, because that's, that's the, the new buzzword, but you can scale these micro uh, services instead of whole systems. So the traditional scalability also applies too. So if I only need to increase uh, my ability to process orders, I can just spin up order, order nodes instead of creating whole new instances of my application. And each service can be written in the methods and technologies best suited to it. So again, if I have an order placement suited that's best suited with, for, for Netty, I can use Netty. And if I want to use Rails for, to 
I mean Grails, for the web browser or the web application, I can absolutely do that. If um, MongoDB is the best database for one application, totally. And if I want uh, a relational database for another system, absolutely. Separation of concerns is a very good thing. And it's fun. Right? Creating, creating these little messages that are flying throughout your system, uh, creating events that fire off and you know, do all sorts of other things. It's, it's, really, it's really fun to see that happen and hum along. However, there's always a downside, right? If you embrace SOA, you, you need to find someone to oversee the team and catch those engineers who are straying from the um, broken up path. If you catch somebody who's adding too many you know, features into one service, you need to have somebody to oversee that and stop them and say, hey, it's time for a new service. And this can be you know, an architect. It can even be a team of people that are observing this. Um, furthermore, there's some non-trivial upfront time investing in a service communication format. Right? So if, if these systems are communicating with each other, you need a standard messaging format to all understand. And the communication between these services has a cost, particularly if it's synchronous. If these two services are making HTTP calls directly to each other in the background, that, that can be very slow. Um, and having, if you scale up these individual services, having a web of these things can, can quickly make it hard to manage. Right? Having, to, having, having to, for each system to know exactly where the other ones are located by IP, by IP address is, uh, can be cumbersome to manage. And there are tools to manage that. There's ESBs and some things like that, but you know, I mean, it works. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> they, 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 do, they do a decent job of fixing it, but we can do better. So, and the point of this talk is, as you might imagine, the reactive architecture. Reactive is a, is a bit of a buzzword, just like microservices. Um, it was introduced by a company called TypeSafe, which is responsible for developing Scala and Akka. Has anyone here used Scala or Akka before? No? Yeah. yeah, they're really nice. Um, but they... Uh, uh, what am I saying? Uh, TypeSafe touts Scala and Akka as the de facto standards for what this reactive stuff should be, but that's not necessarily you know, true. So they, they created this reactive um, buzzword, and it involves four principles. A reactive system must be event-driven. So the communication within the system and, action, and all actions and commands should be done via events rather than long procedural code. Small little bursts of method calls that do very small, rapid things is um, you know, the ideal situation here. And so by operating on events, this naturally promotes highly decoupled code. The sender and the recipient can be constructed without having to know or care about the implementation details about the other. Does that make sense, right? Because rather than making direct method calls on other properties, I just emit an event. And whoever wants to listen to that can pick it up and do their own processing. There's no, what's the, uh, there's, there's a term, they don't need to know the details about each other, which is great. Um, and if you were at my talk yesterday, a um, big fan of this event, the, the, these event systems, because we can use these events to monitor the history of our application. But that's a whole other tool. A reactive application should be scalable, um, both in the uh, traditional being able to stretch and grow as, uh, as, as demand is placed on the system, or as demand lessens. So you um, should be able to scale dynamically. So if I have um, an AWS deployment, I should be able to very quickly and easily um, replicate my services or shrink them, depending on the need of the system. And like I mentioned earlier, it's more than just machine deployment. The scalability is also about how easily your developers can maintain and build upon your application. It should be resilient, which means a, re a reactive application should be resilient to failure because if one service node goes down, then the others should be able to take up the slack without having to, uh, without the end user noticing that there was a problem with the system. The system should be able to carry on. As an example, if in our e-commerce application, we're, we're not able to take order, the order system goes down the user should still be able to browse and put stuff in the shopping cart. It should be responsive, which means if the user requests data from it, it should, app bar, it should respond to, uh, 
to commands very quickly, or as fast as possible. The less, the less time the user has to sit staring at an application, the happier they'll be. And again, like I was saying earlier, there's no one correct <coughs> reactive architecture. TypeSafe likes to say that Scala and Akka are the, are the only ways to do it, but it's not exactly true. It's more of a, it's a mindset or state of being. It's something you need to have in your mind when you're writing applications. You know? always, be, always be concerned about efficiency. Always be aware of how things, uh, you know, how resilient they are, whether they're fault tolerant, you know, that sort of thing. And, but TypeSafe put together these, these um, tenants, or these points, into what they called the Reactive Manifesto, which is a website online, and you can, you can sign it with your, with your Facebook or your Twitter account, and they have you know, your little photos of each of the, users, of the people who signed it. And it was something like, uh, was, as of when I took the screenshot, it was 4,677. My name's on there somewhere, but they have a terrible paginated list. I was trying to find myself, and it's hard to, I gave up. Um, but one of the points they say in the manifesto is that an application must be reactive from top to bottom, which implies that if we take the original e-commerce example, uh, how do we make this reactive from top to bottom, right? So it's, you have to think about it not just for each of these individual service nodes, but for how these systems are communicating between each other. So that implies we want small event-based services that internally are able to, to handle um, faults and are internally able to um, be resilient and not depend on other, on other ones. And we have, in the Groovy world, excellent tools for, for, put, for putting together these systems. Rails, great. There was a great talk yesterday um, about uh, microservices using Grails and how there's not really any issues with them. And Grails has a, a nice async adapter and lets, lets you do some event-based stuff. Uh, there's Ratpack, which I don't know if anyone's checked that out, but it's built on top of Netty. And so the entire thing is based on using events. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and then Netflix created a library called Rx Java, and there's a Groovy adapter for that, which lets you use this pattern of observables, observables? to do uh, um, pub, publish and subscribe uh, methodology. But beyond the microservices, the, the, the systems should be communicating each other via asynchronous events. And how do we facilitate these events? What, what systems could we use? There's various tools out there. Again, there's, there's you know, the, your classic ESB, but they're very big middleware that usually you see in enterprise systems. A little bit unnecessary for this. So one of the best tools that I like um, is to use a message broker. So a message broker, is a, it should be, uh, depending on how it's implemented, a very lightweight <laughs> system that accepts, uh, that uses an exchange and uh, accepts messages from your system, puts them in a queue, and then another service will then pick up that message and consume it. We should be routing these messages asynchronously through the message queue whenever data needs processing or an event is emitted. We should do our best to ensure that these messages are kept restful and that consumers only operate on the data within that message. And we should be able to add these additional nodes to handle load without additional configuration. Which means that if I take my original system and put in a message queue, this little X stands for the exchange, we have, we have a, a handful of queues that can attach to this exchange and we set up our shopping cart and our uh, order placement system. And we hook them up to a queue tied into Exchange. When a user comes in and is browsing the product and they click on the little add cart, that should emit an event through the Exchange, which then routes the, 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 uh, the event about the order placement to a little shopping cart service, which is aware of, uh, of the, you know, the inventory and says, okay, I am uh, now keeping track of this product and the user's cart. And then if the user checks out their cart, that, that emits another event to the order placement system, which could, which could communicate uh, and request the current state of the cart from the, from the cart service, or the front end could just pass along whatever was in the cart. And then when the order placement finishes, at some point later in the future, because it's working asynchronously, it would emit an event that, hey, it's time to clear the cart. And if we suddenly say on like Christmas or you know, big Black Friday or big shopping holidays like that, if, if demand increases, we can easily spin up new nodes, attach them to the queue, and the end users never notice a thing. 
we can, and I think this is, this is probably one of the coolest things, we can set up monitoring services that can automatically keep track of And without even really having to worry about it, we can set up scripts using Vagrant or Chef or some of these other DevOps tools to automatically spin up new nodes as needed and decrease them when, when, when the queue size lessens. Think about that. You don't need to sit there and you know, ha, you know, go down and provision a server and talk to your DevOps guys and get them to do this for you. It can all happen automatically. It's pretty magical. Now, in doing, uh, implementing this system also gives us additional decoupling, which is a very good thing. We get additional decoupling on time because things are happening asynchronously. The, um, there's also location. The nodes don't need to know exactly where the other ones are. They only worry about where the message broker is. The message broker, the other systems at tell the message broker where they are, and the, and the broker passes on their correct message as needed. We also don't care about, uh, the term is cardinality, but the number of machines that are in the system. The, if the, the product browsing doesn't need to care how many shopping carts there are or how many order placements there are, just emits the events. Um, which broker to pick? There's several out there, but I'm gonna, my favorite is uh, RabbitMQ, not because Pivotal makes it, but because it's very lightweight. Um, it, whoop, it, uh, it, it, does, it does message persistence, which is a very interesting, which is a very useful feature. So you can, you can be guaranteed that if I emit an event, thing goes wrong, all my services collapse. Those messages stay in the queue to be processed whenever I pick them online, which is a very handy feature. And there's a great plugin for it to fit right into the in, in, integrals written by uh, Jeff Brown and Peter Ledbrook. So reactive architectures are in use by several very large companies, um, and it's gaining popularity. It's growing throughout the world, although these companies don't always refer to it exactly as being reactive. So one example, Netflix. I'm sure everyone's heard of Netflix. They're a, they're a very large, groovy company. They use these groovy and Java extensively. They contribute to open source. The engineering team is, you know, they, they do lots of great things over there. Now, they, they make heavy use of AWS as well. And uh, I don't know if anyone's seen talks on how they construct their, their architectures, but the, with the, with the, with the, they have a, they have a, each, uh, I guess, Netflix, uh, they have clusters that are a series of small services, and they use a tool called Asgard, which is a Grails app, to uh, spin up new clusters of services as needed. And uh, Netflix is very large, very big on resiliency. Um, they have this custom tool called Chaos Monkey that, <laughs> that uh, and what they do is every day from, or every weekday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., a.k.a. the work hours, uh, Netflix unleashes this little level guy into, their, into the system, and its job is to randomly go through chaos, break systems, error garbage data, shut things down. And the goal is this happens. My mic from filming? No, okay, here we go. So to make, it, 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 where was I? to make sure that things are resilient and are able to withstand the chaos. And when bugs are found, um, the, the services need to prove their strength and their ability to stand up to the monkey. Um, this allows Netflix to find bugs, and then, you know, because it happens during work hours, the engineers can fix them quickly and get things back up online for prime time viewing in the evening and on the weekends. Another great example, and perhaps the largest one, Twitter. This is, this, Twitter used to be one of the largest, most monolithic Rails deployments in the world, right? But it got so big that engineers would need to pull in these global experts, they call them, anything done in the code base. So when new engineers would come in, they'd be tasked to add a new feature, but the code base was so massive, they had no idea where to look. So they would spend more time on what they call whale hunting expeditions to track down bugs and they were, they were struggling, but you know, they, they kept up with demand and you know, Twitter became very popular. But the turning point came during the 2010 World Cup. So it's, I, I, was, I thought about putting a Vuvuzela sound in here, the <laughs> but I thought I'd spare you guys. The, uh, anyway, so the, uh, the flurry of tweets brought Twitter to its knees during that, during that game. The service was unavailable. The engineers were out the night to keep the service going. And they talk about this on the Twitter engineering blog, 
which if you all haven't seen this, I, it, I highly recommend going and visiting it because it's a great, great um, example of how, you know, they, they talk about this process and how they converted it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute love letter to, um, they don't actually call it reactive, but, you know, splitting things up into spaces. So anyway, they realized that change was needed. Right? They, they, it was, they were, uh, so what they did was they took their main application and uh, they broke it out into several small services that each were responsible for one feature of the system. The size of the circle represents how many nodes they have that actually uh, deal with that particular, um, actually that, that, that particular uh, service. Um, I know I talked about Rabbit. They use their own system, I think, I think it's called uh, Finagle, yeah. They own a system called Finagle, which is based, it's a similar sort of idea, it's an asynchronous Java-based uh, tool for routing messages to um, observable services. And for, and for each service, they, they, they gave each service its own small dedicated team. That team pretty much only works on that one service. They can become experts at that service. They work together to develop it. Um, and each, they, they, they started switching from the Ruby virtual machine to the JVM. And that Twitter was by no means strangers to the JVM. They had a search feature that was using Java. But they, they embraced Netty and switched to the event-based programming model so most of the services are now based around the Netty and the JVM. Um, their monolithic application, at, at its peak point, could support up to 200 to 300 requests per second per host. After they switched to an event-based JVM system, they're, not, they're now able to handle 10 to 20,000 requests per second per host. That's two orders of magnitude, I think, more? That's crazy. So during that 2010 World Cup, Twitter hit a record of 3,283 tweets per second. And that brought their system to the knees. Now, they average 5,700 tweets per second. They can dynamically scale to 143,199 tweets. That's the record they've ever done, but they could do more. They just, that's never gone higher than that. And they do it with five to 10 f times fewer machines than before. Imagine the savings on that, right? If you're not burning through those, ma those many machines a day, it's massive, right? It's pretty great. <laughs> so so I, I think it just highlights that the architecture choice is, is, is what was more important. So people like, to, people like to use that example as, oh, they switched away from Rails. But the architecture choice was more important, I think. So what does this have to do with Node, you might be asking? Is it, has anyone here used Node before in your project? Yeah. Did, did you like it? Good? Yeah. So I, I, I don't hate Node, I like it a lot. It's very fun, very easy to use, but its biggest feature, and I think the reason why it's becoming so popular, is that instead of using you know, your old system architecture of uh, uh, a, a, thread, a thread pool and a single request comes with a thread pool, they use uh, a event loop system. So it's, which makes Node very good for very small little functions, not good for very long processes. Um, so, one of the biggest things that Node has done is it's increased the popularity, I think, of event-based programming. People are coming on board and they're seeing the power of writing these small little events and small little methods and what you can do with it. Um, however, JavaScript is not a great server-side language. Um, it has a toy garbage collection system. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not very good at cleaning up things. Uh, it doesn't have any proper imports or any proper package management. Although uh, the, the next system, or the next version, will, uh, will, will address this issue. It's got a very strange interpreter, very quirky. Um, I, I gave an example in the last talk. Um, there's, there, there's, there's one called, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of it, never mind. But it's, it's got tricky scoping rules. If anyone's tried to deal with this, or uh, you know, delegates and things like that in JavaScript, it can get a little, little hairy. And it, does, and it has horrible numerical precision. If you try to, if you take, if you, if you can open up Chrome right now or whenever you get back to your computer and type 0 0.1 times 0 0.4, you'd think the answer would be 0 0.4. It's not. Um, and a few years from now, I, uh, JavaScript will be implementing things like floats and big nums and ints, but for now, everything is just a number with bad numerical precision, which makes it not a very good choice if you're dealing anything that relies on having numerical precision. Um, but despite all these things, Node is becoming increasingly popular. 
So this graph is from a web technology survey site called w 3 Techs and shows uh, the percentage of all web apps that respond to this survey and all, all, those, all, all those that are powered by Node.js. And so in, in the past six months, Node has gone from powering 0.02% uh, of all applications to 0.07% of all in, uh, applications on the internet. And furthermore, it's becoming extremely popular with high traffic websites, things that need to have you know, they need to respond quickly to a lot of users, which I think just shows the power of the event-based model. And so what they're showing us, I think, is that this thread pool with a single request per thread is antiquated, and we should be switching to something that uses events. And Groovy has the power to compete with this. And I, I, I think it's, as you know, members of the Groovy com community, it is important for us to spread and talk about the tools that we, that we have available to us to use these uh, event-based um, event applications, which I believe should and could be able to outperform Node.js. So you know, given the opportunity, we should be building more event-based applications on the JVM to show the power of the JVM and contribute back to the community. We should be spreading awareness. You know, talk about it, blog about it. Um, it's, it's, it's great. Um, one more case study, the anti-case study. And this is an example of what can happen if we don't talk about it the power of the JVM, PayPal. So a few months ago, PayPal also has an engineering blog. They decided last year to rebuild the web application which, which they used to serve up that, their homepage, a user's activity feed, and the user's uh, wallet as a re representation of how much money they have, their balance. Um, to mitigate the risk of this new system, they built two versions, one in Node.js, and one in this homegrown, antiquated spring framework that they've been using. And they, they put both the systems into, into service, and they A-B tested it, and then they wrote a really extensive blog post that basically slams Java and uh, puts a lot of hate on Java and you know, praises Node.js. And they released a series of graphs which basically show that the Java application is able to achieve approximately 1.8 page requests per second for a single user. And at 10, requ at 10 users concurrently, the, the Java application is only able to handle 11 requests per second. So it's very slow, right? That's about one, one page a second. An average response time of 1,800 milliseconds, which is horrendously slow. The Node.js application, which they touting to the hills, hey, this is the best. Uh, 3.3 page requests per second with a single user, which seems like a lot. An average response time of 1,200 milliseconds. Say, like, ah, this is two times faster, it's great. But that's still a second response time, right? That's horrible. They're going around claiming that, you know, because they switched to Node that Java's terrible, we should all be using Node. But it can't be the entire story, right? One second for response, it's, it's terrible. So what I think is happening, is that they've got a very, very fast front end in, in, in the node and you know, in Java, but they're talking to horrendously slow back end services. The only system they updated was the, the front end page, but they did not update the back end services. And they're probably still using some old archaic communication mechanism. Which I think architecture choice is more important than any framework that you might be using. Again, should have embraced the reactive uh, mindset. Uh, I think that's all I really have. So I'm going to leave you with this. Don't be, <laughs> be like, <Net> <laughs> be like Netflix. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>